Hey guys, it's Mr. Post, and on today's lesson, we got a few things I want to cover. Uh, we're going to be looking at a brief history of the periodic table. We're going to be checking out how it's organized and laid out. We're going to look at things that are called families on the periodic table, and learn all about the different families, and we're going to check out the different characteristics of those families as well. So that's what I plan to cover. It's going to be a medium-sized lesson, so let's jump right into it, guys. All right, guys, the first thing I want to cover is actually who found the periodic table, and the periodic table is considered founded by a gentleman named Dmitry Mendeleev. He's a Russian scientist. And in 1871, he drafted his first version. And really, really cool, because up until this time, you know, there wasn't really a, a unified system to classify and arrange matter and the elements that were known at the time. And he came around and made one that is very, very similar to what we use today. And what he ordered it on was atomic weight. He based it on atomic weight. And he also based it on the elements, chemical and physical properties. That means their characteristics. So there's three things he based it on. Now, at that time, in 1871, there were no protons, neutrons, electrons. There was Dalton's solid sphere you know, model of the atom. And so he couldn't uh, arrange it based upon what we have right now, which is protons, because they weren't figured out by them. But they did have the relative atomic weights. And that is what he used. Now, if you look at the periodic table, there are some like anomalies, I would call them, where the atomic weight does not increase as you go in order of the elements. And that was something he was aware of, but even still, it was one of the best things he had to arrange it by. So, a little shout out to Dmitry Mendeleev, the father of the periodic table. What's really, really amazing is that he also predicted the existence of a few elements. Like, they were not found at the time. Yes, they were on Earth, but they were not found. He predicted, based upon his classification system, what they would look like, what their characteristics would be, uh, everything about them. It turned out he was exactly right, pretty much right down to the last uh, decimal point. So, a really, really awesome guy, brilliant scientist, but used the best that he had at the time, which was chemical and physical properties and the atomic weight to organize this periodic table. The next dude uh, that really made a significant advancement for us is going to be Henry Mosley in 1914. He's the one who came along and said, let's arrange things by atomic number, all right? This is the number of protons. So atomic number is the number of protons. He said, we're not going to arrange it by atomic weight because atomic weight doesn't always go in order, all right? So a little shout out to Henry Mosley. Protons were just discovered, and he jumped on the proton bandwagon and said, let's now organize our classification of matter, this periodic table of elements, by atomic weight. Okay, unfortunately, this guy died around he was 28 years old, I believe, in World War One. So England lost a phenomenal scientist at such a very young age. So great, though. Now our periodic table looks exactly like it is today. The only difference is that we have a few more elements that were found. Now on the periodic table, our vertical columns are called groups. All right. So just so we're crystal clear, a vertical column is going up and down on a periodic table. That's up and down. These are vertical columns. And the periodic table has 18 of these, and they're known as groups. So no longer in class will I be using the word columns anymore. We're not going to use that. We're going to refer to these verticals as groups or families. Now, the one thing they have in common, every single group has the exact same valence electron configuration. That means everything in column 1 is an S1, top to bottom. has a different? One could be a 1S1, one could be a 2S1, etc. Everything in group number 2 is going to have an S2 in its outer shell. Uh, let's see, 1S2, 2S2, 3S2, etc. So all that's happening as we go down the periodic table is that we're increasing our valence energy level, but the electron configuration stays the same. Now, the families and groups, as Mendeleev arranged them, were based upon their chemical and their physical properties, what they act like and how do they look, okay? And we're given special names to each family because they are unique, just like regular human families. Every human family has characteristics that defines them and makes them similar. Horizontal rows we're going to classify as periods, and there are seven periods. And just so we're really clear, horizontal row goes across the periodic table like this. And there are seven periods, and often they're numbered on the side of the periodic table. One, two, three, 
etc. down to 7 at the bottom. The next thing you're going to notice in the periodic table is that there's this really distinguishing feature that students often ask me right on the first day, what is this black line on my periodic table that cuts it in half? And often it's referred to as the staircase. So people are like, there's a staircase in the periodic table. You are correct in your observation. It's a very, very prominent feature of the periodic table. It is known as the staircase in the periodic table. And it is the divi dividing line in the periodic table between metals and nonmetals. The metals on the periodic table, like copper, silver, and gold, they're located to the left-hand side. And the nonmetals, like oxygen, carbon, helium, neon, are located on the right side. I just want to give a little shout-out over here to hydrogen. That is a non-metal. Right? It's a non-metal, and it exists on the left side of the periodic table. Okay, these purple elements right here, they have a name, and they're called the metalloids. The metalloids have properties that are kind of similar to a metal and ones that are kind of similar to a nonmetal. For instance, like metals. Metals we often think of are going to be shiny, maybe. A lot of them, maybe we might say, are going to be silver, although we do have pennies that are copper and gold. It looks like gold. Uh, we know they can bend, all right? We can bend them and they won't break. If you hit a metal with a hammer, it's just going to change its shape. That's said to be malleable. Nonmetals, such as like a piece of charcoal. All right, charcoal is pure carbon. All right, charcoal is brittle. All right, it does not bend. All right, it's not going to bend. It's going to shatter if I hit it with a hammer. All right, my pen's doing a little funny stuff going on over there. Right, it's going to shatter. So what's really unique is that the metalloids have properties that make them sometimes act like this and then sometimes act like this and that's why they're called metalloids sometimes they're called semi-metals as well this is a little close-up version of our staircase and the elements that are found along it and these seven elements about seven or eight of them are considered our metalloids all right so we're going to highlight right now our metalloids remember the metals are going to be on the left side of our staircase here they are the metals on the left side and the non-metals would be to the right side. The metalloids, right there. All right, guys, it's time for us to start looking at the families of elements. And the first family we're going to look at is going to be on, I'm just looking for my pen right there, right here. If this is my periodic table, the first column of elements is known as group one. And you're going to see that number on the very top of the column. There's one, two, three, four, five, etc., and it goes all the way over around to 18 over here. Sometimes I have 8 or 18, okay? So when I look at the first family of metals, they're called the alkaline metals. Now, yes, we do know that hydrogen right here is not a member of that group, so he's not a member. Every one of these elements has one electron in the outer shell, all right? Every one of these elements has an S1, one electron in the outer shell. And I'm going to highlight in these pictures is one electron. It's already highlighted enough for us in red, but I have one electron in each of my outermost or valence energy levels. And that's why they are all very similar. They're soft and silvery. They are very reactive. These are our most reactive, most reactive metals. All right, forgive me if you see my pen doing these crazy lines here. Sometimes it does that, right? And it does conduct electricity, too. All right, so once again, hydrogen is not a member here. We have one electron in our outer shell, and the one electron actually is going to match our group number one as well, group one. The second family is going to be the alkaline earth metals. The alkaline earth metals are in group number two. All right, so let me find my pen here. Uh, group number one, group number two. These guys, top to bottom, are my alkaline earth metals. They have two electrons in their outer shell, Therefore, they are all are S2s in their outer shell. They're white and malleable, and I want you to know that this is very important. They are the second most reactive group, second most reactive family. Next up for us is the transition metals. All right, the transition metals are located in the D block, like D1, 2, 3. So this is my D block of elements from here to here, and we've done electron configurations D1 all the way through D10. So all I want you to know about the transition metals is that they're the D-block elements, 
That's all I really want you to know about them for us right now. We're not concerned about the reactivity, just know their location. Okay, next up is the boron family of elements. It's known as group 3 or group 13. And you're going to see that at the top of your periodic table is either a 3, and sometimes there's a 13 up there too. Top to bottom, what do I want you to know about them? Really just this right here. This is the main thing. Three electrons in their outer shell, their S2P1s in their valence shell as well. The carbon family. The carbon family is group 4, also known as 14. So 4 or 14 will appear at the top of your column there. Uh, check this out. They have four electrons in their outer shell. Yep, just like their group number, or the very last number in the teen number right there, the 4. What do I want you to know about these guys? I want you to know they're S2P2s in their outer shell. Nothing more than that. Top to bottom, though, it's group 4. It's known as the carbon family. The nitrogen family, same thing here. This is going to be group 5 in the periodic table. 5, or maybe you see a 15 at the top of your, your table. Top to bottom, they have 5 electrons in their outer shell. Any one of them in their valence shell is an S2P3, which makes them similar to each other. Okay, here we go. Something I want you to know about the oxygen family. The oxygen family, top to bottom right here, yeah, that's group 6. 6, also known as 16, all right? They have six electrons in the outer shell. That means they're two away from filling their outer shell. The outter shell wants to have eight. They're two away from it. They're S2P4s. And I do want you to know here, they are the second most reactive non-metal family. All right? Very important for us now. We're starting to see a lot more reactivity as we're getting closer to filling our outer energy level. Okay, now this, energy, this uh, family does have a name. They are considered the halogens. The halogens are group 7 or 17. Top to bottom, these guys are the halogens, group 7. Maybe you see 17 at the top of yours. What does that number tell me? Well, the 7 in those numbers tells me I have 7 electrons in their shell. 2 plus 5 give me 7 electrons. It's an S2P5 in their valence shell. They're all non-metals, and it is the most reactive family of metal, non-metals in the periodic table. The most reactive element in this family is going to be this guy right here, fluorine. The noble gases, a lot of lot of important things here, okay? A lot of important things. Group 8, 18. That means they have 8 electrons in their outer shell. It's a full outer shell. Really, um, that's what all elements desire to have. I'm going to give a little shout-out right now to helium, because helium only has 2 electrons in its outer shell. It doesn't have 8. It's a 1s2. only has 2 electrons in its outer shell. We understand that. It's my exception to what's known as the octet rule. Otherwise, though, these elements are all S2P6s. They are all gases in their natural state, which is a nonmetal. And the one key thing down here, they are not reactive. And that word is inert. All right, inert. I do want you to memorize that word. Inert means um, not reactive. Okay, the rare earth metals. Rare earth metals look at the very bottom of the periodic table. And all I want you to know about our rare earth metals is that this is the F block. So I tell you the F block elements, that's right, they're the rare earth metals. Maybe you want to know this, a little fun fact, a lot of them are actually radioactive. So radioactive means they have unstable nuclei, they want to, nucleus is want to undergo a change, a decay, to change into something different. But they're the F-block elements. They also have another name, and the other name is inner transition metals. Okay? They're the inner transition metals because they fit inside of the transition metals right here. And one of the final things I want to leave you with is there's also another classification, and that's known as the representative elements. And representative elements include the S block over here and the P block elements. So if you're an element and you're located in the S block or the P block, another term we use for you in chemistry is a representative element. Hey guys, that's all. That's the uh, the quick arrangement of the periodic table. A little bit of history there. We learned about horizontal rows being periods and vertical columns being groups. A lot of characteristics about the families. Okay, but thanks for tuning in. Hope it was helpful.